I know I've been on a Divorce Diaries rant for quite a while now, but I just want to take a break to just remind you about this podcast and how I record it. If you haven't heard about Anchor by Spotify, it's the easiest way to make a podcast with everything you need in one place. Let me explain. Anchor has tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. When hosting on Anchor, you can distribute your podcast everywhere. Seriously. On Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. And best of all, Anchor is totally free. Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Again, that's anchor.fm to get started or download the Anchor app. This guy is nuts. Is he really making daily recordings of his possible divorce and releasing it as a podcast? They both cheated on each other? She's making six figures and still doesn't contribute to any joint endeavors financially? Why is she still with him? Why is he still with her? I can't wait for the next episode. This helps me be a better wife. So this is how men think. I hate my husband less now. I understand my wife more now. These are some of the listener comments to the Divorce Diaries podcast all over the map, I know. These anonymous accounts of events should resonate with anyone that has been married, is married, or is preparing for marriage and helps couples avoid pitfalls as they might prepare for marriage. Entire seasons are released on Patreon weeks before anywhere else at Divorce Diaries Podcast Patreon page. Link in description. Now for today's episode. Simply put, I'm just too damn intense what is that like intensity and the fact that I'm so intense like what what does that mean like let me tell you a story um I don't well I'll tell you two both of these will involve I'm not gonna say they're going to involve road rage because nothing really happened on the road. Maybe I'll do three because one has been me multiple times in the car with people and without one involved just myself and one involved me and my son. And you know what? And I'll tell you one that involved me and my youngest daughter. Um, and I'll tell you one that involved me and my daughter. So the first story is where I am so calm and nothing typically happens to me. Um, and I don't typically react. I don't flip people off. I don't give them the bird. Um, I don't curse in my car and bang on my steering wheel and yank on it. I don't do any of those things. Someone cuts me off. I'm like, whoop. That just happened. Someone um, does something else like, oh, that just happens. They brake check me or something like that. That just happened. Okay. I don't really give too much of a shit when people do things behind the wheel because somehow I'm able to put everything through a filter and I'm like, I can't, they can't hear me. They can't see me. They don't know me. And the chances of something, of that person doing that thing in real life is very slim. And they did it to a vehicle. They didn't really do that thing to me. I'm sort of like a personless, a faceless, um, it's like a victimless crime. Because when we kind of see things, you're like, oh man, if you looked and you saw that the person in front of you, let's say they're in a car, but the car is totally removed from your vision. And the only thing you see is the 78 year old woman with big, thick glasses, having a difficult time seeing with very aged hands. You can see her blue veins coming through. She looks feeble. She seems tired but she seems like she's focusing with every bit of strength she has just to get home because this is the, this is only the second time she's driven this month and she's going out to grab her prescriptions and grab some milk from the store so she can get back home 
and take our medicine and see her stories. And this is literally the most stressful part of her month. And you happen to catch her right in the middle of it. If you see that woman, you're actually going to slow down well before you get to the, her vehicle. Because remember, you can't see her vehicle now. It's just her kind of floating in the posture of driving. This is her. This is what you see. And you would immediately spot her from 20 car lengths back. And you're like, I think that's an older lady. As you get to car 18 car lengths away. Yeah, I think that's an old lady. It's confirmed at 15 cars distance. You know what? Let me give her some space. In fact, let me move over and get out of her lane so everyone else can see that this is an older lady. And you know her story. You know that this is only her second time driving this month. So really, you drive 12, 15, 25 times a week. She drives two times a month. So you almost, in your own way, you slap a student driver label on this woman's back and you give her the same distance, time, respect, and calmness and you try not to jolt her with your horn. You just say, oh, I know what this is. And you allow for that. Okay. I try my best to think about the person that could be behind the wheel of that vehicle when I do something or they did something to me. That's what lets me make it more personal, where I don't react in such a toxic way because I don't know who's in that car, what they're doing, and if they even recognize me as me. Oh, I'm, a, I'm sort of a savvy driver. Um, I'm pretty decent behind the wheel. I this, I that. Now, that's why I never freak out behind the steering wheel. I may say dumbass to myself. I may even say it a little bit louder, but that's about as far as I'll go. Dumbass. Seriously? What the fuck? In, the, in pretty much the tone that I just gave you. That's, that's how I say it. Okay. So then there's another thing that happened. I'm in the car and someone cuts me off. Um, they were tailgating me and I was going to Cadoba. They're tailgating me and they're right on my back. And as we enter Cadoba, for whatever reason that night, there must've been a lot going on. Um, there's a very awkward entrance into the specific Cadoba and the cars were backed up in the parking lot, all the way wrapped around and out onto the road. I mean, it's backed up and everyone can see it, everyone notices, and we're all just kind of waiting our turn so we can get into the parking lot. And when I say it's not like a, oh, we were waiting for like four seconds. No, we were waiting for 20 seconds once you get there. By the time no one moves in 20 seconds, you kind of track your eyes up and you see within 15 more seconds that, oh, this is a really bad backup into the parking lot that's stretching around and I'm going to be here for a while. So it's just one of those understood traffic jams where you're just, all right, this is what it is. So we start trickling in one car at a time over about two, three minutes. You know, when you're pulling into Dunkin Donuts or Cordoba or any little small shopping center like that, usually you can kind of get in there. You might have to tap your brakes a few times. Maybe there's a car backing out. and But yeah, within 30 seconds, you're kind of past them and you're in your parking spot or you're beginning to locate the place that you're going to park. That's how it's working. That's how it goes. But this time, we get up to the parking spot sections and we see what's happening. It's just, it's a really tight parking lot. Cars have to do a lot of three-point turns if they find themselves in a tough spot. And that's what was happening. Cars were doing three-point turns. There was one car parked awkwardly. So that's the thing that was sort of making everything awkward for everyone else. So we're all just having to deal with and suffer through the pain. All right, cool. So then we've got um, a guy behind me, back to him. He starts leaning on his horn as I'm allowing this other car to come out of a parking spot. And I'm like, okay, well, but then he leans on it some more and he leans on it some more. And this guy's honking and holding it for about what seemed 30 seconds to a minute, which is a long time in honking dog years. That's a long fucking time. So this guy is leaning on the damn horn 
And I, I said, well, fuck, well, maybe something's happening behind me that I don't know. I immediately do the thing that I do. I kind of internalize it to myself and I kind of decide, well, maybe there's something I'm not getting or there's something I'm not seeing. What is it? You know what? It doesn't matter. He may be doing his own version of sending out a siren, sending out an alarm. Everyone move. Everyone go. He may know something we don't. So I swerve around this guy um, to make it. And it's a little bit of a dangerous move. And then he just pulls up behind that car. And I guess then finally my car was out of the way so he could see why I was stopped. And he just stopped there and he waited patiently, I guess. So then I go and I back in and I'm like, maybe I'm like, where's the fire? Why did he stop? And I'm, then I immediately put it together. Oh, he now understood why I was stopped like that. Okay, well, you know what? Fuck it. He didn't know my car is larger. Maybe he didn't know. And so I back in and he goes by me and he gives me a look. And then immediately I realized he was honking because he was thought I was doing something that I shouldn't have been doing. Okay, that's one. But then once I moved, he saw that I wasn't doing anything that I shouldn't have been doing. He saw that there was a car there that he had to then wait behind as they were trying to get out of the spot. So instead of looking over and maybe waving and saying, oh, sorry about that or whatever, he looked over and he kind of put his hands out like, what the fuck's wrong with you? He had that, what the fuck's wrong with you look? And that was it. Snap. That was it. What I'm learning is we have two parts of our brains. We have the emotional part of our brain and we have the, um, oh my gosh, what is it? The conscious center of our brain? Something like that. There are two parts. And if you put your fist, uh, Dan Siegel, I think he's a scientist that came up with this and, um, or came up with a way to articulate this. If you take your fist, you ball it up, but you don't have your thumb untucked. Like you're going to make a fist, like you're going to punch something. You tuck your thumb in first, fold your fingertips down over top of it to make what you would have is a tucked in thumb sort of fist. And that thumb underneath, I believe that's your emotional center or maybe that's your connection center, I forget. And your fingers are your um, connection center or emotional center, whichever one, one or the other. And if you raise your four fingers up on top while leaving your thumb tucked inside at your palm, with your fingers coming up, it resembles something like a lid that is flipped and that is where the saying goes when your connection center and your emotional center separate lift those fingers up and bring them down lift them up bring them down that is called flipping your lid and that's what happened in that second I flip my fucking lid and this guy what made me flip my lid was realizing that this guy was just a pure asshole and was not paying attention to what was happening and even once he saw it he must have flipped his lid too which is why he probably leaned on the horn he wasn't able to notice things he wasn't able to connect things as it related to the emotions that he was feeling so his lid was flipped and I was the recipient of him flipping his lid and then once I realized everything I flipped my lid so I get out of my fucking car I go over to, and he's in the car with his wife. Wasn't a good move on his part. I was alone and by myself. And I was ready for whatever came next. I walk over to this guy's thing. He has his window down. Hey, buddy. And he starts to open his car door. And I said, get the fuck out of your car. I wish you fucking would. You don't know who you're fucking talking to. You don't know who you're dealing with. And I'm doing all this posturing and puffing and big shits coming out of me and all kinds of words of all sorts of colors. I'm in this guy's fucking ass. His wife's over there. She slides down as low as she can fucking get in the seat. Oh my God. She wants to get out of there. She's probably a little bit scared because now what happened was mortality and realizations were being, were coming very close to each other in proximity with these two males. Her husband lost his shit, and he usually probably talks big and bad in the car, but now he's confronted with an actual human that he may have to fight. And that's when life and reality hit you. Me too, because now I'm out of my car. And now I'm walking over, and I can't stop myself either. I'm just fucking walking over and I'm like, okay, motherfucker, this is it. This is, it's on. And he 
somehow was snapped back into reality. Maybe it was, maybe his lid came back down. Maybe his lid was never popped. Maybe he was always more reasonable and rational than I, maybe he was always as reasonable and rational, but he just thought that he was in an alternate reality and he could do and say whatever he wanted. And then the reality of me in front of him changed things. Sorry, man. Sorry, sorry. Okay, okay. okay. He puts his hands up and starts to kind of back away and gets into his car. I'm sorry about that. And I was just like, and you better not be going in a fucking Kadoba to get no fucking tacos because I'm going in there. And if you walk in, there, I'm just going. And I was serious because I have this thing, I think, where people aren't being righteous. I want to write that wrong. I feel like the world is already bad enough. So when we, as people, do things like hurt others when they don't need to be hurt, when we exacerbate situations, when we show huge amounts of frustration, um, and we drag other people through the mud, I believe that's the worst thing we can fucking do. Um, the second situation, sorry, we're recording this part. Uh, the second situation, the first situation was just me, you know, saying seriously in my car. Second situation was jumping out of the car, confronting a man and he retreated. Then I got my fucking hero complex on because I'm so righteous, I'm a soldier. And I changed the world by telling a bully to shut down. So in the third situation, I'm with my son in the car. And I was the fucking model shitty parent person, not even parent, just model shitty person and parent. I say to my son, or no, I'm sorry, same part of town. So I've got all these connection points of familiarity. This guy, piece of shit, is doing something erratic on the road. And he did some swerving. He did some cutting off, some brake checking, just some really horrible things. And... We're headed in the same direction, and I'm like, if this guy goes to the same place, then I'm going to fucking follow him. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. <clears throat> I'm doing a lot of posturing and a lot of puffing. Maybe there was some ego stuff with my son being there as well, and I'm like, oh, shit, you know, I said that I'm going to do this, so I better follow through. Um, but I know that I wasn't actively thinking about that. I was just, my lid was popped. It was, my lid was flipped, and so I... He pulls into the same fucking shopping center and he heads inside same shopping center and he goes into the market that we're going to go into. And I say, oh, fucking, oh, fucking a I'm almost I almost feel like in some weird, sick way, God is divinely giving me permission to kick off in this motherfucker's ass. And he's got some red jacket on and he goes into the store. And I go in behind him, uh, find him in whatever aisle he's in, picking up his fucking grapeseed oil or some bullshit. I don't fucking know. And it doesn't fucking matter to me because I am righteous. I was right. I shouldn't have been cut off. I this, I that. Me, me, fucking me. So I go and I try to locate this guy and I do. And I, sh I will say that I behaved as badly as anyone can or should because modeling a lack of self-control is not a good look for anyone, especially a father in front of his son. And what my son did was something that I am extremely proud of. I'm proud to know that my son is the wingman that you want to go out with. He is the ride or die he is the soldier he is the one that if he's with you there will be punches thrown and questions asked later that is the person you want to go out with you don't want to go out with the person that starts the shit but you want to go out with the person that if shit does go down you know exactly where they stand and you don't even have a doubt of if you'll be left out in the cold by yourself getting jumped whatever so find this guy in the fucking aisle and I'm like motherfucker 
you did all that shit on the road. Let's see what you'll do now. And he's, hey, oh, hey, man, it's not, uh, it's still um, stutter, stutter. Didn't mean to, I really shouldn't have, oh, man. And I'm like, shut the fuck up. I'm like, you were so fucking bold before. Where's the... And out of the corner of my eye, my son, he does this thing. He just kind of moves around to the back of the guy. And he just quietly stands there. And he's just waiting. Just in case something happened, he just put himself in the best position for the worst possible outcome where he could be the most effective in solving this problem for the both of us. Great son. Great kid. OMG. Love him to death for that. But... He got to see this is how you handle someone cutting you off on the road, maybe. It's okay to go inside of a store and stalk them. It's okay to accost them verbally and be ready for a physical throwdown and try to really entice it. What if this guy had a gun? What if this guy pulled out a knife? So am I now in a knife fight? I carry a knife with me, so oh, am I pulling out a knife and now... Does one of us have to die today? Or does this guy pull out a knife and my son sees it and he clocks him in the back of the head and and then we just jump him or something horrible because we're horrible creatures that react and we're so emotional. Is that what maybe has to happen? Is that the horribleness that, that I am? Is that what I would have done? I don't know. But all I know is I flipped my fucking lid and control was lost. Reckless abandon was embraced. And that is what happened that day. That is that is a horrible model of behavior or model for behavior for my son that I gave him. And to make matters worse, here's the last example and last story I'll give and story time today of me flipping my lid, not doing what's right, feeling like I'm righteous in doing it, righteously indignant in the way that I handle myself, in the way that I displace my anger, because I know why I did these things. I was going through the most shit that I have gone through with my wife. And in other areas of my life, I do understand now, if you are not in control of what's happening in your life, oh my gosh, it will have a ripple effect on everything. I should have had much better control over what was happening in my personal life, in my relationship, because that affected everything. It affected how I talked to and treated my children. It affected everything shitty ever. everything I'm sorry just thinking because I think I need to I got to try to set up an appointment with my daughter and I got to talk to her a little bit because I she's owed something and um oh sorry the the, the last story is um my youngest was with me and um same part of town same neighborhood, same area. So it was almost like my pump was primed. The triggers were there. And I'm just like, oh, this is what it is. Oh, this is what we do. Oh, this is what's happening. Okay, I'm in. And I just became this this thing, this person. So um, my, um, this woman, I couldn't tell that it was a woman tailgating to the point where you know you you can't see the lights and she cut off a few different drivers she brake checked some she came back in front of me so she was doing she was just all over the world doing this to everyone and when she's in front of me behind me i'm sorry i said okay to stop this erratic behavior because it was only a short time before we had to make our turn and go into the supermarket i slow down um not brake check i just lift off the accelerator and just make my car a very stable this car is going to go about 15 miles an hour through this 20 mile an hour area before they turn in and every move is going to be measured and she just kept trying to kind of get around me but there's no there's only one lane and she kept trying to swing around left swing around right swing around left swing around right she was doing all of this erratic stuff very very unsafe stuff that this woman was doing and uh 
then once we went into the parking lot, she parked and she goes into the same store. And I, you know, I'm righteous. And I'm, I should be able to do this. And I should be able to do that. So I pull in. And I can't leave my daughter in the car because she's too young. And I'm going to take her in because we're just, we're supposed to be there. Get this. We're supposed to be there for to pick out some fun foods for her to eat and try stuff she hasn't eaten or tried or tasted before that's what we're there to do so i go and that's that pull my daughter out and and i see the lady and i go up I'm like and i don't curse at her like i did before in the past with my older older kid but my daughter gets to see her father lose his lid flip his lid and lose his shit and this time it's her bigger father on a smaller woman telling her, what's your problem? Don't ever drive like that again. And I, my daughter's hand, my kid was in the car. That was unsafe. So I'm trying to keep it kept in high ground while I'm doing the most low ground shit, starting to fight with a woman in a fucking supermarket. And her response was absolutely priceless. priceless. I needed that to have my fucking pretentious, high strung, holier than thou bubble burst she's like i don't care great model oh this is great parenting and she's pointing down at what i'm doing basically calling me out for all my shit that i'm doing which i really really fucking appreciate looking back on it now because what the fuck is what the fuck is my deal why couldn't i just enjoy my fucking night because I'm embroiled in whatever personal shit is going on with my fucking wife. And then I'm taking it out on my children. I'm taking it out on these drivers that are tailgating me. They're flipping their lids while I'm flipping mine. And I can only control myself. I'm the one that chose to stay in this toxic for me relationship. That's no one else's fault. I did not have to take all of my shit out on other people. Why did I do that? Why did I drag them through the mud that I was in? I made the strategic choice to stay in the fucking mud. That was my stupidity. I did not have to make that choice, but I did. Why should they have to suffer for the bad choice that I made being with my wife, I don't, it, I have learned that my perspective has been so negative for almost the entirety of my life. I understand where it comes from. I need to understand and unpack the knowledge of having the narcissistic parents that I've had and the abuse that I've suffered with them. It's sort of a, it's a really difficult tangle of wires to unravel because there's so many connection points I'm finding with, oh, your mother was a bit manic and controlling, but it was packaged as if she was a sweet, caring, giving person, so the wrapping paper around her emotional abuse abuse was one of purity that felt like it maybe was righteous. So because you viewed or felt genuine love from your mother while you were being abused, you likely will perpetuate that same quote-unquote love that you feel you got from your mother. You will likely perpetuate the same controlling aspects of life. You would likely do it because you're like, but that's a good thing because it's good to try to control situations any means necessary manipulation that's a tactic that i've learned i've used i'm like i wasn't manipulating you i just i just strategically set these things up so that this outcome would strategically would happen based on the strategies i chose and it's like yeah motherfucker that's manipulation you didn't let things just happen 
you set things up or put things in motion to to create an outcome. So it's like, oh, that's manipulation. It's like, yes, motherfucker, that's manipulation. You manipulated a situation. Oh, shit. I thought I wasn't. I didn't think I manipulated a situation. I thought I was being righteous. It's like, no, you're not being righteous. It's literally the last thing you're doing. If you were righteous, what I know now, if I was if I was truly righteous, when I got cheated on, when I didn't do anything, you know, let me take that back because that makes it seem like I'm some sort of perfect husband or something like that. I'm not, obviously. I'm recording diver- divorce diaries and I'm talking about all the bullshit that I've ever done. So I'm a piece of shit and have been a piece of shit and can be a piece of shit. I've also been good. But my perspective has been, well, see how good I am, treat me good. I'm a person that had a lot of expectations. I did this for you, so you should then do this for me. I did this for you, so you shouldn't do this. Don't you see? This is equitable. And I would lean on those words like equity, respect. I respect you, so you should respect me. No, that's not how it works. Respect is earned. And if someone never did it, if someone did not earn your respect, why do you give them respect? That's what I should have done. But I always wanted to look at things like, I'm going to throw this in your face. I'm going to throw that in your face. Respect, 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 respect. So it's just, it's very weird now understanding the way that I moved in the past the way that I thought, the way that I figured things, and I really, and the the ways in which I really tried to act like I was righteous when I wasn't. I didn't accept the fact that I could be righteous in some ways, but where I had no influence Like, just go into the market with my fucking daughter. Just go. You don't have to go out of your way to make sure the asshole knows they're an asshole. Why are you there? I'm there to have a good time with my daughter and have the most enjoyable day. What's this going to require now that this person cut you off and they tailgated you and they almost ran you and your daughter off the road? What do you do now? Okay. I don't think I do anything. I think I... Let it roll off my back. Make sure my daughter's safe. Maybe even take some time in the car to let this person leave the market. Or if I go inside and see them, because they probably didn't even see me in the car. She's just freaking out. She doesn't even know what the lady was freaking out about. And then I just safely take my daughter in and we just have a good time. Possibly right next to that person. And who knows what might have manifested. I might have heard that person on the phone. And they're talking about their mother that just died from terminal cancer. And I get to see them actually going through something and feeling something. And that maybe that explains why that person just did what they did to me on the road. And why do I have such a self-importance complex where I think that someone wanted to go? Why am I so important where someone would go so far out of their way? to make sure that I know that they want me to have a bad day. That's what that woman did. She got up that morning and she's just like, you know, at 7.05 tonight, I'm going to fucking, I'm going to fuck somebody's day up. And it's going to be a guy and his daughter in their car going to go look for burritos at the fucking supermarket. That's what I'm going to do. That was her intention when she got up in the morning to fuck me over. How cocky, arrogant, self-aggrandizing a person do you really have to be like I am to really think that I am that fucking important? It's tough, but I got to tell myself, bro, you are not that fucking important. I'm not that I'm not important enough to get the respect I thought I deserved for my wife. I'm not that important where my parents thought that they maybe shouldn't use me as their own whipping post. Like I'm using my kids. 
I'm not that important. And once I do the the work of bursting my own fucking bubble of self-importance, the better off I'll fucking be. Because Lord knows, I just, Jesus. Put more good into the world than you take out. And that is going to require something called patience, grace. It's going to take a lot sometimes to fucking eat crow. Yeah, it would have hurt for me to walk away from my fucking mom earlier. It would have hurt to walk away from her. But I ended up walking away from my mom in the end to disconnect and stop talking to my father because of his toxicity and the hurt and pain that he was inflicting on my life, willingly inflicting inflicting on me. It was rough, but I really, really, really needed to do it. And had I done it sooner, I probably could have saved myself a lot of heartache and headache. Walking away from my mo- my wife when she disrespect after disrespect after disrespect. That would have been the absolute best thing for me to do. But I didn't. I didn't do it. I just fucking didn't. I gotta reread that book. I had the audio book, The Hard Thing About Hard Things. And I, I don't know, I, I didn't have the paradigm shifts that I've had lately. I haven't been in therapy. I wasn't in therapy at that time. And I think I need to go back to these renewed and new perspectives and see like, all right, what the fuck? What am I thinking here? How do I feel? How are things going? I'll do that. But yeah, I fucking flipped my lid, and that's what flipping your lid is. Your connection center, your emotional centers of your brain separating from themselves. Therefore, you have a lid that flips. It flips. The lid flips. I'm, um, I'm a work in progress, as we all are, and I don't know, this one wasn't really so much about divorce, but this was about me, and it was about how I respond to stress and I know that as a father, as a husband um, for as long as I will be um, husband, I am not yeah. just because I got shitted on doesn't mean I get to shit on other people Wow, that was the Divorce Diaries podcast. The Daily Saga will continue tomorrow. The full season's episodes are on Patreon now. Subscribe for early access. Click the Patreon link in the description. Hopefully these entries help our anonymous recorder as a form of his own personal therapy. That's his hope and his intention. Will these recordings of life's curveballs lead this family to the best resolution in the end? We'll keep listening. New episodes are released daily on all podcast players, but all episodes are available on Patreon at Divorce Diaries Podcast Patreon page. Until next time.